And uh, welcome back again, Dr. Tabor. Good to be with you. So we've got a good one today. It, uh, we're going to keep going on the teacher. And in the previous one, we talked about his career, you know, kind of right. like the life and times of the teacher. What little tidbits can we gather together from the Dead Sea Scrolls? So today we're going to delve into something very controversial. We often say in the scholarly world, Judaisms, to just make the point to the general audience, that often think, uh, oh, what was Judaism like in the time of Jesus, or 100 years before the time of Jesus, or 200 years during the time of the Maccabees? And we have texts and sources on that. Some of them are in what people call the Apocrypha, like the Maccabees text, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Ben Sirach, some of those texts are even in a Catholic Bible. And then we've got a whole thick collection of texts even before the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the Dead Sea Scrolls are truly the mother load. Uh, we would be of all men most miserable if we didn't have the Dead Sea Scrolls because uh, it fills in for us a movement, a messianic movement in the Holy Land that uh, rises about 100 years before the time of Jesus and flourishes. And we've got the library of this group, not the complete library, it's fragmented, but just to have any of it and even complete scrolls. And right. we're going to talk about one today that we think goes back to the teacher himself. So uh, some scholars have called this Enochian Judaism from the book of Enoch, particularly Remember, our Enoch, which comes from the Ethiopic version, uh, other than fragments here and there, uh, it's divided into five books. But the first book is what we normally think of as standard Enoch. And that first book actually does give us kind of a matrix, a lot of concern about the heavens and the layers of heaven and how mm -hmm. the cosmos operates as you move up and down the underworld and what's going on there. And that cultural world, that religious world, that conceptual world of the period, we have tremendous light shed upon it, new light in terms of the Dead Sea Scrolls, because they're living within that. They talk constantly about Belial. That's their way of referring to Satan or the devil. And uh, not in the old Hebrew view of just somebody that opposes God or you know, a counsel for the prosecution in a court case like Job. Now, this is a wicked guy. He doesn't have a tail and a pitchfork, but <laughs> wicked spirits in heavenly places. And when you read Paul's genuine letters, he's just overflowing with this kind of stuff about demons. And I was prevented from this and Satan opposed me. In Galatians, he says, Satan's the God of this world. He talks about principalities, powers, heights, depths. Now, we don't have this directly in the Gospels from Jesus' own mouth, but he alludes to those things in ways that help us to realize whoever we're reflecting within our New Testament Gospels, particularly Q and the Synoptics, is, re is uh, coming out of this same worldview. It's apocalyptic, it's messianic, but it's cosmological. Um, right. I sent you a link earlier called The Bad Idea That Took Over the World. It's but actually a blog post, so if you could call that up. But uh, I can't read it here on the screen, but you'll see I talk about my teacher, Jonathan Smith, and how I learned that all religions of the period are Hellenized. And we've tended to think of, oh, if I see a pagan deity or if I see this kind of artwork or something, uh, that's Hellenistic. And then everything else is Judaism. But what Smith has shown is that there's a shift in the ancient Near East and in the Mediterranean world that's international. And Jews are affected as much as other cultures. And mm -hmm. it has to do with this vastly expanded universe in which... God or the gods, the good powers, who are way beyond this world, and we're in the lowest, darkest part of the world. And in this video, I think it has like a couple hundred thousand views. You can probably 
see if I just can. shared the link so everybody can yeah. go to this. Everybody can go to the like, link. But yeah. the, so by Enochian, we just mean the kind of matrix, the cosmological assumptions about what is the universe and how is it set up and what is our place within it. And it it merges into forms of Gnosticism. In Gnosticism, you're mainly asking who am I and what am I and how did I get here and so forth. So anyway, I just want to mention that link. But then we and, got the course. Yeah, the course. Yeah, I just want to mention up front. Sign up for the course. I pinned that comment and become a student. Join live with Dr. Tabor in these Zoom conference calls that are coming up. He's doing them with students for both the Mark and uh, Dead Sea Scroll. We're really mainly focused on Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls now. But you know. okay, yeah, Paul is. You know, a lot of us were influenced by Jonathan Smith, by Peter Brown, his famous article, "The Holy Men in Late Antiquity." And we learned in graduate school to consider the cosmos. And as you don't just jump in a text, you, you want to know what was the worldview of that text. The air is thick with powers. And then what happens when you go down into the lower world? And essentially, it's to place yourself as a human being. Where are we? What are we? Uh, the classic Gnostic question. And we don't even need the label Gnostic. It's the classic human question. But in the Hellenistic world, it would be like, from whence did we come? Mm. To what have we fallen? What is death? What is birth? What is rebirth? And so forth. So you get all these things about death and rebirth and sometimes referred to as resurrection and heavenly glorification. So the scrolls are just our new example when they were discovered in the 1940s into the 1950s of a apocalyptic messianic group that is preparing the way in the wilderness, referring to prophecies and so forth and trying to fulfill them. I wanted to say on that Zoom meeting, uh, normally I do Zooms with the course I'm current with, and that was Mark, early part of the year, and we did, I think, eight months of Mark. Okay, now I've gone to the Dead Sea Scroll course, but for this coming meeting on Sunday, uh, the 28th of January, the Mark students are invited too. And the reason I wanted to include them, first of all, to encourage them to sign up for the Dead Sea Scroll course. I sort of like, it's like in, when I was teaching uh, full-time in the university, I'd have a cadre of students that kind of went along with me yeah. and got more and more advanced. So, you know, they took the Mark course, then they take a Dead Sea Scroll course. So I think about half of our Mark students haven't signed up for the Dead Sea Scroll course. And I don't think it's because they didn't like the Mark course. I get the impression that most of them like it a lot. So why would I invite them? Well, I want them to sign up. Okay, I'll be transparent. But you know what the other reason is, and this was also the December meeting, is we're talking about a messianic figure that begins to see suffering and probably even dying as part of his destined fate based on reading himself into the text of the book of Isaiah, the so-called suffering servant songs. They're found in chapter 42, chapter 50, chapter 49, and then 52 through 3. Everybody knows 53 if you were raised as a Christian about he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. We esteemed him not. We despised him and so forth. And people for centuries have asked, who is that? And one answer is it's the nation of Israel. But in these particular four hymns, it gets individual as well. It's first person mm -hmm. in, in, in a couple of them where the servant is, speaks and says, I, I, I as opposed to Israel as the people. So he's someone within the people of Israel. And, and Jesus appropriated some of those texts as well. They're quoted in the New Testament, particularly Isaiah 53 as alluded to. So I wanted the Mark students to come too, because we're dealing with this idea of another figure, a hundred years before Jesus, reading his Isaiah. And by the way, we have the Isaiah scroll from cave one. And we also have the Thanksgiving hymns that I'm going to talk about today. It's another scroll from Cave 1. There were mm -hmm. 11 caves altogether. So Cave 1 is the first cave. And there were seven scrolls in one of the jars in that cave. And they're fairly complete. And one of them is a copy of Isaiah. 
And it's got these interesting little marks in the margin where someone reading it might be marking their Bible. Can you imagine that? We're not sure. But if you look at where those little marks are, it could very well be someone thinking, now this is really a key passage to think about. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And so uh, fortunately with this teacher, we may have something better than just speculation. I've got it printed out here. And if you sign up for the course, you get this. But this is a, a section of the Thanksgiving hymns. There are 40 Thanksgiving hymns. That's too many to cover today. Nine or 10 of them in the middle. They're usually numbered 10 through 17. You actually have the teacher speaking in such a singular autobiographical way that many scholars refer to these as the teacher hymns, meaning either he wrote them or someone wrote them in his name in the first person. And they begin to have a different character because he begins to talk about himself. And one of the things he does is he picks up on the language of that suffering servant material in the book of Isaiah, as hmm. if he's drinking it in and appropriating it and maybe beginning to interpret his own life, career, and destiny in the light of the servant songs. And they say things like, I was not esteemed, I was rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and so forth. Um, if you'll wow. bear with me, I've marked just a few things to read from this yeah. quickly. And I'm going to do it fast where I can just go through and read them quickly. You've This is... This is the teacher, and I want you to imagine a person reading these texts and then appropriating the language and thinking, this is me. He says, you, you as God, you've appointed me an object of shame and derision to the faithless, but truth and understanding to the upright. The wicked have stormed against me, but you've appointed me as an ensign to the chosen, you see how he thinks that he's special. He's mm -hmm. been appointed in a very special way. You've made my face to shine with your eternal glory. He then talks about somebody delivering a male child through the pangs of Sheol and from the womb of a pregnant one, a wonderful counselor with his strength. That's a messianic title from Isaiah 9. Remember, wonderful counselor. He apparently thinks he's that counselor. You've redeemed my soul from the pit, from Sheol and Abaddon. You've raised me up to an eternal height that I might walk on a limitless plane. Uh, I'm going to read just a few more here. I want you to get the language. Uh, I seek you, and as an enduring dawning, as perfect light, you've revealed yourself to me. So any pious person could say some of that, but it begins to get more and more specific. Mm -hmm. he, listen to this. It's right out of Isaiah. Neither did they esteem me when you displayed your might through me. Instead, they drove me from my land. He's in exile like a bird from the nest. All my friends and acquaintances have been driven away from me. They esteem me as a ruined vessel. He's talking about being rejected. They esteem me not, though you display your might through me. Um, let's see. Through me, through me, notice, right. you've illuminated the face of many. That reference to the many is also from Isaiah 53. You've strengthened them uncountable times. Listen to this. You've given me understanding of the mysteries of your wonder in your wondrous counsel. Hmm. Uh, he talks about his suffering. You've not abandoned me to the pit. I read that. Just a few more. Uh, you've concealed me from humankind and hidden me until the time. So he, you know, the fullness of time, he thinks that he's been sent. Even those who share my bread have lifted up their heel against me. Does that remind you of anything? Right. Uh, you know, his own, and he talks about my own counsel and so forth. But as we, I'm going to skip ahead because there's just so many here. You've appointed me as a holy counsel to the weary. You've taught me your covenant. My tongue is one of your disciples. From the womb, you've known me. You've set me apart. From the womb, you've known me. Isaiah 49, call me from the womb. Uh, the Apostle Paul quotes that too. 
But toward the end, here's what we get. This is in a fragment of the Thanksgiving hymns. It's in cave four. He says, there's none comparable to me in glory. I've been, I'm a mighty throne in the congregation of angels I have sat upon. There's no one comparable to me in glory. No one shall be exalted beside me. None shall come against me for I dwell on high in the heavens and there's no one I'm reckon, no one else. And I'm reckoned with the angels and my abode is in the holy congregation. That is the most, I would say out of all the things you've said so far, yeah. that was like Jesus 1.0. I mean, that was like, I yeah, am the one. Might have yeah. said that. Yeah, he, you know, and this is why I want the Gospel of Mark students to get into this and dive into it if they haven't taken the Dead Sea Scroll class or, and you can come to the Zoom this Sunday, whether you've taken it or not. Because I want us to talk about the kind of consciousness, you know, mm -hmm. the self-consciousness of somebody who begins to think, I'm the one, I'm the final revelator. And remember what this one is supposed to do is gather all of Israel to him to bring about the redemption and so forth. And so he's really uh, an amazing figure. Uh, now, it's a real question. Let's, let's stay with Mark as our earliest record of this material. Jesus in chapter 8 starts breaking the surprising, shocking news to the disciples that just knocks them over. And Peter, being the spokesperson, even rebukes Jesus when he hears it, as if to say, and I don't know the words, but he probably said, no, 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 no. We're going to Jerusalem, and we're taking over, and you proclaim the kingdom of God, and we're going to rule and reign and get rid of these bastards in Jerusalem, and the wicked are going to be punished, and the righteous will triumph. And all of a sudden, he goes, well, actually, first, look at John the Baptist. They did to him what was written of him. That's what he says in uh, chapter 9 of uh, Mark, what was written of him. Hmm. So now that could be Mark, the author of Mark, of course. after the fact, as you said, creating a Jesus who's filled with the concepts of a suffering servant, who's not esteemed, rejected, despised, and cast out, and even perhaps killed. We'll get to that because we're not sure if he was killed. Mm -hmm. But no, even if he comes to the gates of Sheol, which he talks about, I read, you know, you brought me to the pit of Sheol, and then he comes back up. There's a fine line between today you'll be with me in paradise, that's Luke's version of the cross, remember, and he breathed his last. If the next second you're redeemed, have you kind of been raised from the pit? You see the idea? Because quite a few scholars are convinced that resurrection is apotheosis, meaning there was a faith that Jesus was exalted to the heavens, just like this guy. No one is like him. Uh, that's pretty extraordinary. But it wouldn't be a body going around in Jerusalem for, what, 50 days after, as the book of Acts has it, or the book right. of Luke. It would be more Mark's view of a transfigured entity. That's what Mark 9 is about, you know, where they see him in glory, Moses, Elijah. It's like a vision of the kingdom of God, a proleptic realization of the kingdom. So they're into the glory. Oh, are they? They're all ready to go down and take over the buildings. You know, look, master, at these beautiful buildings and palaces. We're all going to be there. And remember, they're fighting the whole time on the way to Jerusalem. Who's going to be first? Who's going to be on the right and left hand? And Jesus in Mark keeps saying, wait, wait, wait. I think you skipped some chapters in Isaiah about being rejected, being, you know, or Zechariah, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and that kind of thing. And then Jerusalem is surrounded by armies and then the kingdom of God comes. So here's the question. Did Mark or the followers of Jesus, after he's dead, complete surprise, where they were sure he would not even be crucified, but if he's going to be crucified, he's suddenly going to call the legions of angels and crush his enemies with earthquakes and so forth, all kinds of glory, and then take over the world, you know, kick the Romans out, set up the kingdom of God, offer eternal life to his followers and so forth. So is that the way it was? 
or did he begin in his own life to think about, uh, I don't know, maybe the path is first suffering and then glory. And that's how Mark puts it. And that's the big stumbling block of Mark. Like, when is the kingdom coming? How is the kingdom coming? And Jesus and Mark keep saying, well, first you get a little seed, and then you get a leaf, and then you get kind of a full plant, and finally a huge tree, as if it's, I'm planting a seed, but it's not going to just spring up tomorrow. It, you know, it has to kind of germinate and grow and uh, achieve its time. In its time, it will come. So if we have an example in the Dead Sea Scrolls of this teacher, and, and I've just read you for some of the teacher hymns, mm -hmm. he seems to have that idea, or I, I grant this, his followers might have put it in his mouth. Right, 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 right. Yeah. However, when you read it, this is like, a we don't have Jesus' diary, right? This is like <laughs> the guy's diary. Exactly. I mean, it literally looks like his own meditations in a very personal way. Like he says things like, my father and mother abandoned me, but you, O oh Lord, took me up. So I want the students to actually read the scrolls. It's so great. You know, everybody's heard of the scrolls. Everybody talks about them. If people have heard of them, they say, oh, isn't it great? We have the scrolls. But what about reading them? And in the course, we look at translations, of course, of the core scrolls. And what do we have? Ten lectures. I take you all through them. Talk about every aspect of the scroll group, as well as some of these remarkable parallels. But what we're going to do Sunday is particularly talk about what was his uh, career and what can we say about him? And if he was pursued and persecuted by the priests in Jerusalem, including the high priest, according to one text that we covered last time in your live session, mm -hmm. did that go as far as having him killed? And that we're not sure of. He definitely died. But did they kill him or did he finally just die? Did he die of diseases? Did he die of weakness? He describes... In, within these Thanksgiving hymns, these teacher hymns, he describes himself as uh, just kind of falling apart bodily somehow. Was that from his suffering? Was that from something in his life that we don't know about? We just don't have records of that. But it does say in Isaiah 53 that the suffering servant will bear our diseases, as it's called, you know, meaning our ailments, our frailties, our weaknesses. And he seems to have this constitution of talking about himself as, you know, I'm weak and I'm forsaken and I'm forlorn, but you lift me up. All the messiahs we know about, and I'm using messiahs, I explained last time, right. very generically, just the key core redemptive figure, anointed by the Spirit, mm -hmm. however, and then you can have a priestly messiah, Davidic messiah, and so forth. But this most exalted messiah, David calls Lord. So you have these two messianic psalms, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. And the idea seems to be that Jesus mentions this in the Gospel of Mark. It's his last question. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, you say the messiah is of David, but why would David then, his father, his ancestor called oh, his son. Lord. Yeah. L-O-R-D. Why does he call him master? And they don't know the answer to that. He seems to be implying there are many messiahs. Every priest is a messiah. There have been various people that have thought they were anointed by God. But there's going to be a final messiah. Now, I wanted to mention this book. You know, why would I promote somebody else's book? Because it's so wonderful. Michael Wise, The First Messiah, investigating the savior before christ we, wow. we i'm really recommending this to the dead sea scroll students you don't have to buy it it's not required for the course anyway what michael begins to do in that book is to show you all of these passages and how they're appropriated and how he really is an exalted figure above even a davidic messiah you know like he says in the text i just read None of those who sit upon thrones can compare to me because I have a throne in the heavens. Mm. You see this guy. Well, Jesus 
if they if he believed that he was going to be exalted to the heavens and receive glory like in Mark, the transfiguration, where Moses and Elijah and Jesus are in an altered, transformed state, and he thought that was his destiny. I think it's likely that it goes back to the historical Jesus. I don't think, you know, think about other messiahs we know that Josephus mentions. There's probably a dozen of them. They all get killed. Right. But if you don't believe in gathering arms, gathering your followers into a kind of armed resistance and fighting and dying that way, but you're arrested and you don't resist. See, this is the thing. Remember Isaiah 53. Every Christian knows this. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opens not his mouth. So he's not drugged, kicking and screaming to the cross, cursing his enemies and saying, God will get you soon. Right, right, right. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, he forgives his enemies. And in our earliest teachings of Jesus, love your enemies, do good to those that persecute you. If someone strikes you hard on the one cheek, turn the other and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so he does seem to be different. And this figure, I don't know that he would say, don't resist your enemies because we have a scroll about how the sons of light are going to defeat the sons of darkness. But a lot of it is God on your side. You know, when you read that scroll, I mean, they're not going to be able to fight 20 Roman legions with their own strength. So it could be that Jesus, maybe the teacher, uh, they realize they're going to go before the end. And yet they believe that God will exalt them. And I would even go to the Apostle Paul there, Romans 8 particularly, where Paul is talking about the glorification of that he's expecting and all of the followers, this heavenly glorification that he proleptically experienced when he was taken up to heaven and entered paradise. I wrote my dissertation on that in my book, uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, that people can read. It's all about that. But what does he say in Romans 8? We will be glorified with him. Sounds like Mark. Mm -hmm. Provided we suffer with him. So what does Jesus say in Mark? You want to follow me? I'm going to the cross. Take up a cross and follow. And if you become a servant, he says, a servant, that means a slave, become the least, then you'll be exalted. So the great will become low and the low will become high. You get that kind of reversal that you see many places in the New Testament. So you're getting that also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's in Isaiah 53. Remember how it ends? Because the guy is suffering and dying and finally even buried, for this reason he's been highly exalted and he's been given this position Reminds you of that Philippians hymn, you know, yeah. a name above every name. I mean, it's almost like I just read you a versions of, version of Philippians 2. Right. You know the name Morton Smith. I'll never forget in the 90s, Morton Smith got hold of this scroll that I just read that you said you were most impressed with. Yeah, it's that was the one. 491. Yeah. He got hold of it before it was published. And, oh, wow. He thought, <laughs> finally. My whole thesis that I've worked on in terms of Jesus, he called it the magician, but what he means is the cosmic, one with the cosmic power to work his way through the heavens has been vindicated because we actually have a text of a guy now before Jesus who said, you know, this is what I'm all about. Right. And so uh, he gave a paper, I remember, at the uh, Society of Biblical Literature and the American Academy of Religion. And you know what he said? He got up. I'll never forget it. This is Morton Smith, if you know his name. Here's his personality. He slams his fist on the podium like this. Hear that? Oh, yeah. Cock-a-doodle-doo. I told you. <laughs> and then he holds up a copy of the text that he'd gotten from the person who was translating it. And he said, this is the teacher. And he's been exalted to a throne in heaven. I've just thought about it. And then I was like, let me pull to the passage in Revelation 11, where it talks about the two witnesses. Uh, we know this is a highly apocalyptic eschatological book, full of imagery, lots of violence. And of course, the hope that God's angels and, and such comes and redeems and destroys the enemy and brings the new Jerusalem, etc. Well, in Revelation 11, 
it's two witnesses who get killed. Their bodies are left. Uh, the yes. abyss is opened. They end up be getting resurrected. Um, and I'm wondering, this is or totally caught up to heaven. They're caught so, up to heaven. Okay, so this is this is what I wanted your thoughts about because there's this constant two Messiah motif that you've harped on, and I wonder if you personally interpret this Revelation 11 thing through the lens of something on the two Messiah. Is this is this John the Baptist and Jesus? Is this Elijah and Elisha showing up on Mount T Transfiguration? W what do you think is going on in Revelation 11? Yeah, Revelation 11 owes a lot to the Dead Sea Scrolls and not just Revelation 11, but lots of the language in Revelation. And uh, if you know Josephine Massenberg Ford, now deceased, I taught with her at Notre Dame. You know, I started my career at the University of Notre Dame. Josephine was a colleague. And she published the initial volume of the Book of Revelation in the Anchor Bible series. And she was a specialist also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And even though that has now been superseded with another volume that is more generic and useful, I still like Josephine's volume. And if you can get it, it might be out of print. I'm not sure. It was the first version of the Anchor Bible Revelation because she gives all these parallels with the Dead Sea Scrolls that you wouldn't believe. Just the right. kind of language based upon the Hebrew and the Greek and so forth and what sort of concepts are being carried and yes, the two messiahs fits wonderfully, and it comes from Zechariah. In Zechariah, you have my two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. But the Lord of the whole earth is not Adonai, Jehovah, or Yahweh. It's mm -hmm. Adon. It's the idea of this pyramid. There's the Lord of the whole earth, Adon, that's Psalm 110, Psalm 2, remember? Yep. Why does David call him Lord? Sit at my right hand. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a stool for your feet. Mm -hmm. See? So that's the Adon, but he has two messiahs. So however you put it together, and it might have changed in terms of history. You know, was it John the Baptist, priestly, Jesus Davidic? Or was it Jesus as the Adon, the Lord, mm -hmm. and his two messiahs? Remember in Mark, again, Mark chapter 10, two of the disciples come up, James and John, and go, Right, Lord, Adon, you know, you're the Lord of the earth. You're the one God has chosen. Could that be a messiah who's anointed of the spirit, Isaiah 61? The Lord, right. has, a, the Lord has anointed me. So here you've got the Lord Yahweh anointing me, the Adon of the earth, who then has two messiahs, Zechariah chapter 3 and 4, and also in Zechariah 6. So you get a priestly and a Davidic, but maybe even a third figure. If you say the heavens and the earth will obey his messiah, is that a king ruling on the throne of David on earth, or is that this idea of somebody being exalted to the heavens? I tend to think that the whole movement of early Christianity is moving towards, movement is moving, there you go, is, is advancing or in the direction of, I'll use other words, of, of this heavenly exaltation for everybody. Right. You who have followed me will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, that could be on earth as it is in heaven. But then in the book of Revelation, you ask about the book of Revelation, toward the end, you have the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven onto the earth. Mm -hmm. And the gates are the names of the tribes and the 12 apostles. Right. And they're ruling on earth. But it's in some transformed, almost we would say eternal kind of uh, new creation of earth. Right. With, without so a Revelation is saturated with this stuff. Right, and the right, Gospel right. of Mark doesn't have all of that, of course. But notice, those those are anointed ones, and they die. So we don't have to go hunting for dying messiahs. You've also got, in chapter 12 of Zechariah, a very interesting verse that's difficult to translate. Literally in Hebrew, it says, they will look 
to me, God speaking, to me, concerning the one or about the one that they pierced and mourned for him as one mourns for an only child. And then it talks about the tribes of Levi and the tribes of David will both mourn. Very messianic again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, Christians picked up on that. Remember, Book of Revelation, they're go every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. They think, oh, that'll fulfill when Jesus comes right. in the clouds of heaven and so forth. So all these groups, think of these texts as kind of floating around. They're kind of categories and candidates and possibilities. And then different figures are trying to figure it all out. They think it's like a messianic mosaic that's going to fit together. And then click, look, all the pieces fit. This is it. Right. The problem is there are always missing pieces. We thought we had the whole thing. Each group thinks it has the whole thing. And then what they must expect to happen doesn't happen. That's not a cynical comment. It's sort of a, it's a historical comment. Right. It's a realistic comment. Now, there's Jesus didn't return in the clouds of heaven and so forth, as he said. Now, all your preterists at that point, Dr. Tabor, how could you not know? <laughs> how could you read it so literally how like a ignorant person? Look at all the ways these things are applied symbolically. Of course. But look, as Paula Fredrickson said, uh, I just quote her again. Oh, yeah, the archons are all defeated. Death right. is no more. There's no more disease. There's no more suffering. Every tear is wiped away. Uh, you know, uh, doesn't seem like it. So, right. I think if we read these things in the broader context, the people who are hoping and dreaming of this transformation are not talking about some symbolic internal thing that might happen to the people that believe it. They're talking about the world being transformed. Paul says, don't even get married. He says that don't even go into business. Don't worry whether you're slave or free. Don't sue the, real life issues. Right. Marriage, don't go and sue these business, people. Economic, social status, right. Right. cultural status. And he says, that's all passing away. Right. It, it's the form of this world, the schema, it's called in Greek. The schema is passing away. So I believe that the Dead Sea Scroll group is also expecting that. And there are lots of texts that we cover in the course where they talk about what will happen when the sons of light rule. And they say, for example, that our days will be like the days of a tree and we will live a thousand generations. Well, a thousand generations is, is a poetic way of saying eternal life because mm -hmm. you live from one generation to the next to the next. And a thousand means forever. So, Have you ever wondered about what's really in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Everyone has heard of them, but what secrets do they reveal? Join Dr. James D. Tabor on a thrilling journey as he delves into these ancient manuscripts discovered in caves over 2,000 years old that rewrite history and challenge our assumptions about Jesus. Dr. Tabor has spent decades exploring the scorching Judean desert where these treasures lay hidden for centuries. He has walked the same paths as John the Baptist and Jesus. Was Jesus influenced by the Essenes? The answers lie within the scrolls. This is more than just a course. It's an expedition into the unknown, a self-guided online course you do at your own pace. Enroll now and begin your own exploration today.